Today we have part one of the story with the headline, Story of the Golden Yukon. Canadian surveyor describes the region, history and prospects. The subheadline says, the first discoveries in the original Klondike rush, character of the country, difficulties of prospecting, and the magnificent rewards that await successful miners in the richest gold region of the world. Practical information as to mining methods, other minerals besides gold, no agricultural possibilities, interesting personal reminiscences. It says, Mr. William Ogilvy, the Dominion government surveyor of the Northwest Territories, has passed many years in the Yukon country and is recognized as an authority respecting it. He recently delivered a lecture on the subject in Victoria, British Columbia, which was published in full in the Victoria Colonist. Some of the interesting features of the lecture are here given. Mr. Ogilvy begins with a description of the routes leading to the Klondike District, and with these, newspaper readers have been made pretty familiar during the past few months for the detailed descriptions of correspondence. The Discovery of Gold Touching the first discoveries of gold, he says, early in the 70s, an attempt was made to get over to Teslin Lake by Kassar miners who had learned of the existence of a large lake northward from Kassar. Several men tried, but unsuccessfully, and returned disgusted. In 1872, September 2nd, two North of Ireland men from country Antrim, named Arthur Harper and Frederick W. Hart, George W. Fitch, who came from the vicinity of Kingston, Ontario, Andrew Kanzler, a German, and Sam Wilkinson, an Englishman, left Manson Creek to go on a prospecting trip down the Mackenzie River. Harper, because gold had been found on the Liard, which empties into the Mackenzie, and is one of the principal branches, was under the impression that there was gold on the Mackenzie. They made their way down Peace River by the Finlay branch to what is known as Halfway River. There they met a party of men surveying for the Canadian Pacific Railway and unwittingly helped to drive a spike in our great national highway, because they gave their boat to the survey men to make their way up the Peace River. Harper and the others packed their provisions up the Halfway River and over a 25 or 30 mile portage to the waters of the Nelson River, down which they went until they found it safe for the passage of canoes, where they made a cache and proceeded to make two dugouts with which to ascend the Nelson. In 1891, I was sent by the Dominion government to examine the northeast portion of this province, and coming out by the trail followed by Harper, I saw the cache which Harper had told me about in 1887. Well, Harper's party made their way down to the Liard River, where they met two men named McQuesson and Mayo. Wilkinson determined to try his luck on the Liard and left the others. Harper, Hart, Kanzler, and Fitch went down the Mackenzie, across to the Peel, and thence over to Bell's River, an affluent of the Porcupine, and down the Porcupine to Fort Yukon, where Harper saw an Indian who had some native copper, which he said came from White River. Harper determined to try for it, with Fitch and Hart, he went 400 miles up the Yukon to White River in September, and then up White River until they were stopped by running ice, when they made their preparations for winter, building a cabin of suitable dimensions. From this point, they made prospecting excursions in various directions, mainly in search of the copper, which they did not find. The first prospects. In the spring, being short of provisions, they made their way down the river, prospecting as they went. The result of their prospecting, Harper summed up to me thus. On the Nelson, nothing. On the Liard, colors. On the Mackenzie, nothing. On the Peel, fair prospects. On the Porcupine, colors. On the Bell, nothing. And on the Yukon, prospects. To obtain provisions, they had to make their way to St. Michael's, and on their way back, they encountered McQuesson and Mayo, who had gone into the service of the Alaska Commercial Company. Near the mouth of the Kayakuk, Harper saw an Indian with some gold, which he said came from a mountain in the vicinity. Harper spent the winter of 1874 to 1875 prospecting at the point indicated, but found nothing. McQuesson and Mayo, as a result of a conversation with him, went up the stream and established Fort Reliance in August and September 1874. Harper joined them the following summer, and a partnership was formed, which existed until 1889. Klondike prospected in vain. Fort Reliance is only six and a half miles from the mouth of the renowned Klondike. While trading, it appears that they made very few and short attempts at prospecting. The valley of the Klondike and its affluence is a favorite hunting ground, but they never prospected there, and if they had done so in the Klondike itself, they would have found nothing, 
for its bed consists of coarse gravel, for which fine gold would have soon gone out of sight, and at that time, no prospecting was done except surface work. In the summer of 1887, the valley of the Klondike was prospected for upwards of 40 miles, with no result. Again, in 1898, it was prospected and nothing found. Early in the 80s, gold was found on the Stewart River. In 1886, Mr. Harper erected a trading post at the mouth of the Stewart for the benefit of the miners there, some 30 or more in number. In the same year, coarse gold was found on 40 Mile. Now as coarse gold is what all miners principally search for, as soon as this discovery was made known, Stewart River was deserted. Harper left Stewart River in June 1887 and went down to the mouth of the 40 Mile, where he began the erection of a residence and trading house, the nucleus of the famed town of 40 Mile. First Rich Strikes From the headwaters of 40 Mile, many went over to the headwaters of 60 Mile, the two being separated only by a low, narrow divide, and Miller and Glacier Creeks were discovered. Miller was considered the richest creek in the entire country for several years, but were not at all compared with Bonanza or El Dorado. Miller and Glacier Creeks were believed to be in Alaska until I produced the 141st Meridian, which is the international boundary line, and found them well in Canada, so far that there can never be any question as to which side of the line they're on. 40 Mile with 60 Mile was the mining ground in that vicinity until 1891, when gold was found on the headwaters of Birch Creek. This was the origin of Circle City, which is on the banks of the Yukon, about 200 miles below 40 Mile and 8 miles from the head of Birch Creek. This town was begun in 1891 and absorbed the attention of a great many at 40 Mile and the bulk of the newcomers. There are a couple of gulches at the head of Burke Creek, which were thought to be rich and are good, but they cannot be compared with El Dorado or Bonanza. First Gold on the Klondike The discovery of the gold on the Klondike, as it is called, although the proper name of the creek is an Indian, Troende, was made by three men, Robert Henderson, a Canadian, a native of Prince Edward Island, Frank Swanson, or Norwegian, and another man named Munson, whose nationality I do not know who in July 1896 were prospecting on Indian Creek. They proceeded up the creek without finding sufficient to satisfy them until they reached Dominion Creek, and after prospecting there, they crossed over the divide and found Gold Bottom, an affluent of the Klondike, where they got good prospects and went to work. Provisions running short, Henderson retraced his steps to the mouth of Indian Creek, leaving the other two at work. From the mouth of Indian Creek, he went up to 60 miles, but failing to obtain a supply there, he had to make for 40 Mile. On the way down, he passed an old mining comrade named George W. Carmack. Henderson at once advised Carmack of the discovery on Gold Bottom and advised him to try there. He went down, found Swanson and Munson at work, but was not satisfied with the prospects there, and determined to return and prospect the creek, now known as Bonanza, from its head downward, as it lay in the direction of his way home. The Bonanza Strike he found nothing of note until he came down about midway, where from a little nook in a bend of the creek, he panned out a good prospect. This encouraged him to try again. He did so, and in a few moments, panned out $12.75, which he put in an old cartridge shell and corked with a piece of stick. This was on August 10, 1896. He then made his way down the creek as fast as possible and went down the river for a supply of provisions. On the way, he met several miners and informed them of his discovery. At first, they would not believe him, as his reputation for truth was not above par. These miners said they could not tell when he was telling the truth, if he ever was, as he was the greatest liar this side of a great many places. Some of them came to me and asked my opinion. I pointed out to them that there was no question about the man having the $12.75 in gold. The only question then was, where did he get it? He had not been up to 60 mile, nor yet to 40 mile, and he must have got it somewhere near where he was engaged fishing, and that was right at the mouth of the Klondike. The rush begins. Then followed the excitement. Boatload after boatload of men went up from 40 mile. They went up anyhow in any way, starting at all times of the day and night. Men who had been drunk for weeks and weeks, in fact, were tumbled into the boats and taken up without any knowledge that they were travelers. One man indeed was so drunk that he did not realize that he had left 40 Mile until he was more than two-thirds of the way to the Klondike, and yet he owns one of the very best claims in the Klondike district today. 
the whole creek, a distance of about 20 miles, giving in the neighborhood of 200 claims, was staked in a few weeks. El Dorado Creek, seven and a half for eight miles long, providing 80 claims, was staked in about the same length of time. Boulder, Adams, and other gulches were prospected and gave good surface showings, gold being found in the gravel in the creeks. Good surface prospects may be taken as an indication of the existence of very fair bedrock. The news went down to Circle City early in December, and it at once emptied itself and came up to Dawson. The scenes of the 40-mile rush were repeated. The miners came up any way they could, at all hours of the day and night, with provisions and empty-handed. On their arrival, they found that all the creeks had been staked weeks before. A good many Canadians and others who had Circle City had out-American the natural native-born Americans in their protestations and professions of Americanism, came up to our territory in this rush with certain expectations of realizing something in the new finds by reason of their nationality, and in Canada made loud professions of loyalty, cursed their luck, and declared it strange indeed that a Canadian or a Briton could not get a foot of ground in his own country. Wealth of Bonanza and El Dorado Bonanza and El Dorado Creeks afford between them 278 claims. Their several affluents will yield as many more, and nearly all of these claims are good. I have no hesitation in saying that about 100 of those on Bonanza will yield upward of $30 million, and about 30 on the El Dorado will yield a million dollars each. These two creeks will, I am quite confident, turn out from $60 million to $75 million, and I can safely say that there is no other region in the world that has afforded so many homestakes, that is fortunes enabling the owners to go home and enjoy the remainder of their days at their ease. Considering that the work has had to be done with very limited facilities, the scarcity of provisions and of labor, and that only the crudest appliances are as yet available. When I tell you that to work properly each claim, 10 or 12 men are required, and that only 500 were available that season, it will give you an idea of the difficulties which had to be contended with. On Bear Creek, which joins the Klondike about 7 or 8 miles above that, good claims have been found, and also on Gold Bottom, Hunker, Last Chance, and Cripple Creeks. On Gold Bottom, as high as $15 for the pan has been taken, and although we cannot say that they are as rich as El Dorado or as Bonanza, they are richer than any other creeks known in that country. A fact easily demonstrated is that from Telegraph Creek northward to the boundary line, we have in the Dominion and in this province of British Columbia an area of from 550 to 600 miles in length and from 100 to 150 miles in width, over the whole of which rich prospects have been found. We must have from 90,000 to 100,000 square miles which, with proper care, judicious handling, and improved facilities for the transportation of food and utensils, will be the largest, as it is probably the richest gold field the world has ever known. The British Columbia Minister of Mines may wish to extend that down to the boundary line, but that, of course, I leave to him. Quartz Claims Seven quartz claims have been located already in the vicinity of 40 Mile and Dawson. One of these, named Cone Hill, about two and a half miles up 40 Mile River from the Yukon, is a veritable mound of gold-bearing rock and would require generations to work out. A save showed from $3 to $11 per ton. The only question is, will that amount pay for reduction under the conditions there existent and the enormous freight rates incidental to transportation to that vicinity? About 40 miles farther up the river, two large claims have been located by an expert miner hailing from the United States who has had considerable experience in Montana and other mineral states, and he assured me that the extent of the load on which these two claims are situated is such that it is greater than anything else in the world, his assay showing the value to be about $8 a ton. On Bear Creek, a quartz claim was located last winter, and I drew up the papers for the owner. I have been told that gold has been found at the head of Lake La Barge on a stream flowing into the lake from the east. Prospects, too, were found on the Dalton Trail, on the other side of the Yukon River. A man riding across the Ausick on this trail was thrown from his horse and, in clambering ashore, caught at a small tree, which pulled up by the roots. When he landed, he saw something shining on the rock. He picked it up and found that it was gold. He showed me this gold at Fort Cudahy in July 1896 the amount being about a dollar and sixty cents. Other prospects have also been found along the same trail, about midway between there and Selkirk.
from these circumstances and discoveries, it may be assumed that in all this country there is gold, while in this particular zone it is especially abundant. This zone lies outside of a range of mounds which extend to the westward of the Rockies and has the same general trend. It consists of Cretaceous rock, rising into very high peaks in some places and crosses the Yukon River just below the boundary. Copper and Coal Another product of the country that demands attention is copper. It is doubtless to be found somewhere on the White River in great abundance, although the location of the main deposit has yet to be made. Mr. Harper saw a large piece of pure copper in the possession of the Indians. Indeed, I have seen it myself. It comes from the vicinity of the White River somewhere, just where it has yet to be disclosed. Silver has also been found, and lead, and in addition, to work these when the proper time and facilities come. We have coal in abundance. It is found running along the base of the last described range of Cretaceous mounds. A deposit of coal in this range runs right through our territory. At two points near 40 mile, it crops out prominently, in one place only about three quarters of a mile from the bank of the river Yukon. A short distance above this, it crops out again, only about eight miles from the Yukon. And whenever the Conehill mine, which I have spoken of before, is worked, the coal to work it is only about some 14 or 15 miles distant from the scene of operations. About 30 miles farther up, on one of the many small affluents of the Yukon, it again crops out a few miles from the bank of the main river, and at 15 Mile Creek and at the head of the Fronde, there are also outcroppings of coal. On the upper branches of the Stewart, coal is said to occur in the drift, and again about six miles above the Five Fingers, coal drops out on the banks of the Yukon River. In fact, there is any amount of coal in the country with which to work our precious minerals when we obtain the necessary facilities. Check back soon for part two of this incredible story. This story comes from the great state of Iowa, being reported in the Alton Democrat of January 8, 1898. Thank you for joining us today. If you want to continue to uncover all of America's lost and forgotten history, then remember before you leave, to hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and remember to like and comment below. And we will see you next time on Americana Archives.